Welcome to the Roll for Crit podcast, the official podcast for the online board game store, RollForCrit.com. Watch, shop, play. I'm Jonathan Estes. I'm Will Keeler. And today we are still reeling from when someone pushed over their soda on the drinking table. It was, it was a disaster. You probably heard about it on the 6 o'clock news. Luckily, uh, the carts were sleeved, so minimal damage. That's right. No casualties, only injured. <laughs> uh, really unfortunate, but our, our hearts go out to the cardboard and paper that made up the components of that game, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, we're a little bit late to talk about E3. A little bit. <laughs> that, that came and went, but we can talk about a somewhat related video game game, board game game game. This is kind of a weird one. So they announced this new version of Monopoly. It's called Monopoly Gamer. Uh, but really, it's Monopoly Mario. Right. Uh, which I think already existed. Yeah, except it's literally the same skin on. Like, it's nothing. It's, a, it's right. It's Monopoly with this, Mario. The whole uh, idea behind this is, like, it's not just Monopoly. We actually have... New mechanics, I believe, like it's items and stuff. Right, so the things that are different about this version of Monopoly, it's got your standard, you know, you're, you're buying stuff up, you're buying Bowser's Castle or whatever. Uh, you have coins for money instead of paper. Of course. <laughs> uh, your characters actually have special unique abilities. So uh, the game is Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Donkey Kong. And if you land on a certain space, they can do a thing like they can steal coins, or maybe uh, they'll get uh, cl- get to collect their rent a second time, or when they get that power up on all their properties, something like that. Uh, and there's also a power up die, which when you move, you roll that, and it could be something like a red shell. So there's mm-hmm. a little Mario Kart in there, uh, and the red shell you hit the person, somebody you want, and steal coins from them. So more more back and forth theft. <laughs> Uh, in this version of the game. And then there are also boss battles. And actually, that's the way the game ends, is once someone fights Bowser. So every time you pass go, you can fight a boss battle, which you must pay to fight. And then you're rolling a die, and you want to hit that number. (laughs) And if you hit that number, you beat the boss, and you get points. So your final score is actually a combination of boss points and regular Monopoly. So there's... That's sort of, I guess, a different way you can win the game mm-hmm. instead of just going for your property collections. So there's a lot of weird stuff in this game. Actually, there's one other really weird thing, which is they're also releasing separately booster packs. For two ninety nine. you can buy extra characters. Comes with a figure, maybe a couple cards, but the, they have a new power that's different, although I don't know, theoretically, couldn't you just take any object and say this has a new power and make it up? But it's not the official piece. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, they are, there's 3D now, painted models. Now, here's, here's my question. Yeah, I have many. As a Nintendo fan, uh-huh. <laughs> is this enough, and as someone who does not want to play Monopoly again, <laughs> I should also add, are these rule changes enough for you to even consider playing it, possibly buying it? Uh, definitely no to the second question. <laughs> uh, I would maybe try it out of curiosity if somebody happened to have a copy. I, I can guess that no one we know ever will. <laughs> oh, you will, because that's your birthday present. <laughs> right? Um, but it is, it's interesting. The thing that's so strange to me is the, is the name. Why they chose to go with Gamer, which is such a generic term when it's clearly well, focused on Mario. Well, because I think what they're actually planning to do is, this is Monopoly Gamer, the first one. I think they're actually going to try to do, like, Monopoly, because, you know, they have deals with everyone already. Monopoly Gamer Halo. Monopoly Gamer, you know, whatever. That makes sense. I, but th- I wish they had just called this Monopoly Gamer Mario then. I, on, also, I just think the term Gamer... It's almost, especially like in light of after Gamergate, it's almost like a negative thing now. <laughs> I feel like they might have, could have gone with something different, but I mean, I guess it's cool that they're trying to put a new spin on Monopoly, but uh, I mean, I get it. It's going to sell probably a million copies. Well, the thing that also makes me laugh, because I was thinking, I was like, I wonder if Bowser is just going to end up like, you know, uh, playing Mario Party. The last event is always the one that actually matters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, probably. I'm sure there's all kinds of things like that in there. Uh, now, that would be interesting. If they actually took a game where somehow, like, uh, you know, 504, where there's, like, so many different games, mm-hmm. it'd be like that, except there's the main board in, like, Mario Party, then you choose a random mini game or something. 
you well, gotta run through that. There's that Mario Party card game that I we've talked about before mm -hmm. that used the digital e-reader to play video games, mini games on a Game Boy. Uh, this does not do anything quite that ambitious. No. Uh, which is a shame. The mini games are the best part of Mario Party, so I don't know. I don't know. At this point, can't they just make a a new game? <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, uh, isn't the company Hasbro making that other Mario? They are game? making that other Mario so. game, which I actually think is a actually a re-implementation of another game. But it is some. It is a step in the right direction. But it's interesting. So that's Monopoly Gamer. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're not the only people, Hasbro, who are repurposing old games for new uses. Uh, so you may have seen on Kickstarter some time ago this game that is now behind us, Stop Thief, which is a game from the 70s uh, where your cops trying to catch a, a robber, and they updated it, updated a new thing. Well, this is from a company called uh, Restoration Games, and they've now kind of officially unveiled themselves and their plans, and the rest of their games will not be on Kickstarter. That was just sort of their jump start mm -hmm. uh, for, for once among companies. Uh, and th this company is actually founded by Rob Devio, creator of uh, Risk Legacy and other games, along with uh, a, a partner of his who was a former lawyer, I guess still is a lawyer, <laughs> uh, but no, no longer practicing. Uh, well, his job is to find out what, le what legal games I'm sure they can actually reboot. That, that is part of it, actually, uh, his, and his name is Justin Jacobson. And their whole, their entire platform is, if you, as you could guess from their name, is to restore older games into new versions uh, specifically, they are looking for games that are at least like 15 years old or older and that aren't in print anymore, that haven't, that haven't been out of print for a long time, that people like or that they like, and they aren't just putting them back into print, but they're really looking at them, tweaking them, changing the artwork, even some of the rules. Uh, for instance, Stop Thief uh, had some kind of an electronic device. This new version, you use an app. So like a, right. you know, it seems like an, a Which natural is, fit. Well, it's also cheaper. Yeah, for sure, um, and simpler for most people today. So that's really cool. I think the other two games that they have announced so far are called uh, Indulgence and Downforce, and I think both of those are not actually the same title as the original games. I, I forget what the, I forget what the original names were. Uh, but I really think this is a really cool idea. We've talked before about how board games are kind of a weird thing where unlike a movie or video game, you can't just digitize it. Well, you kind of can, but uh, it's, it's much, it's harder to recreate it and keep it around for future generations. Well, I mean, even video games have that problem, especially if something has an online multiplayer or lobby rooms, because once those go down, you right. never experience it the same. But no, you know I'm always a big fan of making something that's not limited, and bringing back something that's out of print is always great. I really want to, I dare them to take up the challenge of bringing back Fireball Island. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great one. I would love that they did that. Uh, I, I, I know, I wonder how, what that, if that, because I know some of these games they were talking about, they, there was an interview uh, that I read with them that uh, some of these games are actually in the public domain now. I mean, that's the other thing, obviously. You, you should need to look at those things, because... I mean, sometimes they're in public domain, sometimes, I mean, I can't think of, I don't know what bargains work off the top, but we, I know that uh, movie-wise, the Godzilla vs. Megalon movie was like in limbo for this weird reason of who, like, who owned the DVD rights and stuff and uh -huh. all this stuff. <laughs> and like, so th that's why it's great they actually have a lawyer on there who can parse through and be like, all right, uh, okay, this is actually owned by this guy now because the company went bankrupt and went to him or something or, you know, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that there's lots of fun hoops they have to jump through for stuff like that. And I'm sure that I would, at least I'd hope so, like, let's say, let's take just Fireball, even though I don't know who owns it, but let's say a game like that was owned by a company, went out, and let's say, for whatever reason, Hasbro had it. And they just didn't do anything with it, that one. Maybe they'd be willing to be like, hey, can we make a deal with you so we can print this game and we'll, your lames on it too and... I'm hoping the companies will be like, yeah, sure, that's okay, because we're not having to do the work for it, and you just put our logo on it. Yeah, well, I'm, the thing that it reminds me of that I hope they strive to maybe even kind of be the board game version of is a Criterion uh, film collection, where they do similar things like that, where they look for old movies that are printed. and sometimes if another studio has the rights, but they just aren't putting it out because they don't feel there's a market for it, 
Criterion will make a deal with them and say, well, let us do the work for you and we'll give you a right. of the profit. Uh, and I would all, I also, like one thing I would love, like on the website, you know, they actually go into a little detail of here's the things we changed and here's why we th how we modernized it. Mm -hmm. I would love if they did, again, like Criterion, if these games maybe came with a booklet, with some like the history of the game, who originally designed it, about the I artwork. I think what might be a little bit, maybe a little bit better and easier on them would same idea, but instead of a books booklet, are too hard. <laughs> well, no, because just print more less stuff in the box and less printing. Like uh -huh. if there was like a barcode in there, you scanned and like on the site. I something. guess, but the I mean to me that's like part. I know part you part really of, part of the fun is it's like a premiere, like a collector's item. I mean, we're talking about board games. I mean, if, I you're, guess if you're trying to, to me, digitalize it, well, you shouldn't be buying a board. Well, I guess game. The, to me the reason is also when I think when you mention Criterion Collection, usually I feel like those are the big hits. When the like. I guess that's always no, what I thought it was. They have a lot of obscure they do? stuff. Okay. Yeah. Cuz to me like this is more just games out of print. No, they they definitely have more obscure stuff. No, I mean I mean sure, I mean sure a digital version would be fine, but I mean if then buy, play video games if you like digital things. <laughs> if you like collecting cardboard and paper, I feel like it makes it a natural fit. I don't know. They haven't announced anything like that anyway, but uh, these are at least Stop Thief, I think, is coming out sometime this year. I don't know if they have dates announced for the other two or anything announced for the future, for mm -hmm. that matter, but I think it's really cool. Uh, hopefully they are successful and continue with this line of stuff uh, for Stop Thief and others. Now here's a weird one. Yeah. <laughs> it gets weirder. <laughs> I think that's the name of this podcast. <laughs> it gets weirder. So last week, we I, I mentioned off the cuff this Planet of the Apes miniatures game that was announced. And and you were like, oh, is it IDW? And I was like, nope, different company. <laughs> <laughs> well, then IDW announced their own <laughs> Planet of the Apes game, also coming out. Uh, that's so, just for you. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is maybe more in line with what I was looking forward to. It is not a miniatures game. It's actually a cooperative thematic game designed by the creator, the original creator of Arkham Horror. So I assume that means there will be an actual Cthulhu expansion for this? <laughs> Let's, we can only hope. Uh, but it, it's, it, it's even still gets a little weirder because... It's based on the first Planet of the Apes movie, the original mm -hmm. movie, of which there are certainly enough characters that you could put into this game and let people choose and play as mm -hmm. those characters. That's not how they're doing it. I'll read the, from their description of the game from the okay. announcement. Uh, each player takes control of one aspect of Colonel George Taylor, Charlton Heston, the main character, of his psyche and must work together to survive the planet of the apes. So presumably one person is like his fear or something. One person is his his mind, his his intellect, his That's I don't know. Can I play as his id? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, id ego super ego. Honestly though, this sounds just more like a Cthulhu game. <laughs> like you each playing as someone's psyche? I mean, if you uh, if you ended up on a planet of the apes, you might go insane from madness. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's that's really weird. We don't know really anything else. I don't know how else it plays into that movie uh, or what the gameplay and would be like. They're planning to do one for each movie. That's what it sounds like. We know they're doing multiple Planet of the Apes games, and they're all going to be based on the original series, not the new ones. Uh, so. Presumably, we might see one for each of those movies. There were five, uh, which would be cool, I think. Now, do you think they're all going to play the same just I hope in that movie, or do you think each one's going to be different? I hope they're each different, I think. Uh, it would be cool if they kept the same designer, so there was some continuity there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I don't know. It depends how this one, the first one plays. Right. I mean, I'm just curious whether you think it's going to be more like going from Arkham to Eldritch Horror, which... While different, they're both relatively same mechanics. Or would you want something more like this? Let's say this is like Arkham cooperative, mm -hmm. than going to like uh, lock, unlock or something like completely different mechanics, like a whole new game, even like price. Definitely, some of those movies are more similar than others. <laughs> right, and that's the other thing is I haven't seen the original ones. You have, so you could probably yeah, think com that what may, what would make more sense per movie. Like the first two are pretty closely tied together, and like three, four, and five are jumping through time and almost completely different so that's where you could you could definitely create your very different things going on uh, so I hope that they go that route but it's cool it's interesting that they're, that they're doing this and I'm I don't know if they announced but I'm guessing this will also be a Kickstarter 
because that's how they do most of these. I know uh, Korra that we said last right. week is going to be Kickstarter. Uh, so that's interesting. There's going to be two Planet of the Apes games coming to the Kickstarter. I guess it's because there's new movies coming out and everyone's jumping on the bandwagon. I mean, they we when we do our movie list, the, all of them, are, uh, the recent ones, have been doing pretty well. Yeah, they're successful. But I, I, so why did it take them? three movies to start making games. Well, it's even funnier. It's not just three movies. It's three movies of the old series. <laughs> yeah, that, well, I'm probably because the rights are easier to get. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so uh, that's, that's neat. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But those are currently our big news items, but that doesn't mean we don't have any Kickstarter Pickstarters for you. We do. We do. We always do. We always deliver on that front, usually. Uh, mine this week is called Ducklings. And this there better is, be some... Goose, geese, geese in there. There aren't. <laughs> There's um. only ducklings. I'm sorry. Uh, this is a very different kind of game. Uh, what it made me think of was the, the game. Do you remember the video game Shelter, where you're a badger and you're mm -hmm. taking care of your little badger children? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is sort of like that. Uh, it's for two. Pl I think two players, maybe more. I'm not sure if it goes more than that. Uh, but each person has a family of three ducklings, and you're the mother or father duck or mm -hmm. both. And you're trying to take care of them, and you lay out a set of cards randomly shuffled, and that is your roadmap of the game. And essentially, it's a, you're rolling and moving. Very simple. Roll the die, you can move up to that many spaces. The card that you land on will give you a choice you have to make. Okay. And the choice will be probably something that, in one way or another, will end up hurting your ducklings. Oh. <laughs> and by the end of the game, it's the, the winner is... Who, if your family has survived the most, you could also. There's also a cooperative mode, so you could work together to raise your ducks. But it seems like much more of a kind of an art house uh, emotional game, less about really the fun gameplay, I think, and more about like my duckling. Yeah, like the idea is to really connect with you and make you worry about your family of ducks, which I think is really interesting. I'm always attracted to those kinds of games. I mean, my concern is. Like I said, that I don't know how fun, if it will even be fun, if they well, want it to be well, fun, I don't know. Not only that, you really, for those kind of games, you really need to make sure you're playing with someone else who enjoys that kind of stuff. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> like, more than anything, I feel like there's certain times that can just, other people will just be gone. Yeah, definitely. It's it's not something you want to bring out with your hardcore <laughs> uh, group of gamers. But I I always like when when companies are doing cool new different things like this. It sounds really unique. You can grab it for twenty bucks, which isn't too bad at all. Mm -hmm. If it sounds interesting to you, uh, and here's an accessory. Yes, I thought this was cool. It is a pretty much a you can get a, a cheaper version of the accessories, but it's pretty much accessories and a really nice leather bounded binder for if you're the I, it looked like it's meant designed specifically for the DM, but I'm sure if you're a regular player, maybe you can use it as a character journal. Okay. In our actual campaign, I actually do have a little journal for my character. It's called the Arcana Note, right. by the way. I should have mentioned that. But it comes like with a small DM screen, a pocket for you to put specifically cards. As you know, like they have the D&D cards, so you can actually make a little binder in case you know, like, okay, I can fl just flip to this page, you know, a lot of small pages for character sheets and, and mo making your own monsters. It seemed just like a really sort of cool... Edition, if you really want to invest, like if you do play a lot of DM games and if you're forced to be the, the game master a lot, <laughs> probably a good investment. That sounds cool. It could maybe be a good uh, companion to the, the app that I had a while ago right. on Kickstarter. Seems like role playing games really lend themselves to accessories. There's, there's a lot of cool. We like accessories. I get like there's so many different like things you need to keep track of that it's. <laughs> well, because if you think about it, it's not just the dice. At first, it's just the dice. Then, of course, each person is like, well, I'm a rogue elf who's using a homebrew version who's actually half demon lord. <laughs> and, you know. You've got character sheets. You've got background stories, notes. Your, uh, own, your own monsters. Right. And that's it. Maps. And, and, of course, you're probably making your own world. You Maybe even basing off some of the other stuff. Like, we're doing the... My brother's doing the Zendikar thing, so I made him a whole binder. I looked up how people made Eldrazi and stuff. So Lots of cool stuff. So this, this could be a help. This could mm -hmm. be the first step on that road. The Arcana No goes for $54 uh, for that full set of stuff. They had some different tiers, though. Yeah, I believe uh, it's around 15 for just the accessories. Like a mini, they had like a mini DM sheet, so if you need like a smaller one that's more of a rules reference and you use the big one more to... Because I know like I've seen some videos, people are like, yeah, I just paste like the rules I don't remember here and like the monsters I like I put those on the DM screen kind of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. more like the stuff you actually will look every five seconds <laughs> right um, so check out those Kickstarters 
Uh, they're up right now, mm -hmm. if you're watching this right now. Uh, now, you played a, a handful of games that I believe all three for the first time ever. Yes, all three were for the first time ever. So I'm, I'm curious to hear and what they were about. All three were Kickstarters. Oh, well, how about that? Mm -hmm. Just rolls right off of the last segment. Yes. Uh, so starting with Dyson Stein. Yes, this is actually from the... Uh, from Peterson Games, so same guy who does Cthulhu Wars. Mm -hmm. In this, you're all pretty much mad scientists, and whoever gets the most points wins. Well, uh, and the way it works is there are dice in the graveyard, and you're trying to collect these dice. They're like monster parts, like some from vampires, werewolves, giant mantis creatures. And the idea is you're trying to make the baddest, mo sort of your Frankenstein monster. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so to do that, you're going to you're sending out your monster to collect more pieces, as well as fight the other monsters. And you can then sell the pieces, uh, I guess, store the pieces for points and stuff, or defeat boss monsters. And once someone hits 20 points, and everyone gets one more turn. It was really fun because each monster part has different abilities. It has these nice big dice that you roll. So you're like, oh, I rolled the arm of a mantis, the head of a clown. The, it has all the classic mon uh, you know, movie monsters in there. There must be a lot of dice in that oh, box. Oh, it's, it's a heavy box. <laughs> and uh, each and, dice yeah. it not only has a, like arm, head, and stuff for each monster. It has like, if that's three health or for scavenging and stuff. But it was a lot of fun to play. Uh, the one problem I had with it when we played it is one person just got it was really easy for one person to just get pushed in like far third, mm. and the, I didn't. I think maybe because certain monster pieces are good as a catch-up mechanic, and we didn't use them because the one promo one, mm. because you get points for killing someone's monster, and he didn't have good parts, so I was able to get a lot of points from beating him because he also happened to be in the spaces I wanted. Meanwhile, the other person had an ability and was able to like take eight dice a turn when we were taking only three. So the two of us were just like hoarding all this stuff. I mean, he like barely getting anything. Reminds me of another game that we'll talk about later <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, this sounds like the it's, it's the kind of game where uh, at the end you have like even if you don't win, you have a cool monster to look well, at. Well, <laughs> the thing is, each time you kill the monster, they fall apart. Or if you return to the lab, okay, and you rebuild them, so you get okay. different versions every time. That's fun. Yeah, and that that and it was also fun because the monster has different abilities. So you're like, oh, I want the mummy because that makes me take less damage, and then this guy lets me do this. So, but it's definitely something I feel. Maybe everyone needs to know what monster abilities are, so people know like, okay, this is definitely got to run to get this monster part in the beginning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, this goes well with that, or or like something. this is early game. You have to get this, and but it, it goes well well with his idea, which I do like the sort of asymmetrical. Not everything is the same, you know. Each thing has its more unique thing going for. Yeah, it definitely seems like uh, on the lighter end of Cthulhu Wars. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I think you, you could probably finish a couple games of this uh, before Cthulhu Wars. Uh, all right, next up, Nor Saga. Yes, I think out of the three I play with my friends, this one we just, I want to really play again the most. Okay. In essence, you're all sort of bards and like, not really Viking, but sort of Viking, like they changed the name so it's not actually like the Bifrost or whatever. Okay. And you're all just telling, like, look, I can do this challenge because I had these awesome ancestors. So you pretty much are making a family tree in sort of reverse. And you're trying, you're each given a goal of, like, you need three red chips, two blue, and a yellow. Okay. And you do that by matching up people on your tree or some of them can get a chip on their own. But people can play on your tree, like, I can substitute your character for a ghost character. <laughs> you can kill my characters, <laughs> and that, like you can, yeah, like your tree changes. So it'd be like, okay. because you're all, it's almost like you're, you're telling the fishing story. Is it sort of like gloom, a little bit, but not. You're not covering up cards. It's more like replacing them. Okay, because you could be like, look, 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 look. My great grandfather was a blue wanderer. Actually, no, 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 no. He was a red sorcerer. Like, you're uh, all like mm -hmm. fibbing and stuff like that, which is, and it was just a lot of fun to play these cards. And if you get a certain color combination, because each turn you can do an ability based on your color, and if you can keep that line going down, they get stronger. And that includes the cards, though, that you can play on other people. Like, only certain cards you can. And if you do, they're really bad. They're like, destroy someone's entire third row or something. So if you play too many cards on someone, they're going to bite you back hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it a storytelling game? Not really, but you, just, you could, I think that's sort of, it's that just in. the mechanic. Okay. Yeah, I, I was doing things like, yeah, this guy, you know... Yeah, he, he killed a, an eight-legged horse. No biggie. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you think they didn't just go with, you know, Thor <laughs> and stuff? I don't know, actually, because, like, I know, I was like, I know there's the eight-legged horse. Like, one of the challenges is the eight-legged horse. And, uh, like, I know that's not its name, I thought. Uh -huh. like, 
Maybe they just wanted to have their and, own yeah. thing, be more unique that way. But it was a lot of fun to play and mess around. It's it's really it's really if you like puzzles, it's definitely because you're trying to solve like, okay, how can I get the best resources by placing this here, here, or stuff. Okay, cool, cool. North Saga, and finally, mm -hmm. complicated the board game, the card game. <laughs> this was actually made by one of my fraternity brothers. And I'm finally got I got to play it with another one of my fraternity brothers. <laughs> All and right. this is definitely it's it reminds me of like Flux not as rule change, but sorta of has that rule change effect. Not to the extreme where you're like, oh great, I don't even know what's gonna happen in my next turn. And also rewarding if you are a board gamer, because there's it's like a lot of puns like one of the cards just flipped the table, so you reset the game. <laughs> okay. Or one of the things I did, which is really mean, is the first turn I played a card that was pretty much you either trying to get rid of your pieces on the board or you can get secret win, if, uh, win goals. And I played a card that said cooperative. And everyone okay. showed either a two or a one, and you're on that team. We all showed two. So like, great, we'll all win together uh -huh. playing. And I'm on my turn, I'm gonna play my last piece, but before I do that, I was able to destroy the cooperative rule, therefore we're not cooperative anymore, <laughs> and then win the game by myself. <laughs> wow, the ultimate act of betrayal. <laughs> so it has a lot of fun things like that. There's also like, you can add rules like trading or flipping cards so people have to memorize and stuff or changing orientation of how you can play your pieces. So it's a lot of silly fun in terms of definitely if, definitely a fun game if you have a good board gaming group because you can be like, oh, uh, yeah, guess what? We're playing Flux. Or no, this is going to be cooperative. Oh, I'm flipping the table. <laughs> We're trading cards now. So m lots of good in-jokes. Yeah, it sounds definitely like. a yeah. great, I think, if you're a good board, you have a good, that. if you can speak English, uh, if you have a good board gaming group who's, been in, or, you know around the table for years. I think this is a great game to try to see if you can pick up because it will bring a lot of those funny moments. And it is light, but not too light, not too flux light. In which you're like, I'm, I'm literally gonna close my eyes and the rules will change so drastically. Right. Okay. That's good. Yeah. It's good to have a, a little bit of a step up from that. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like maybe it could make a drinking game. Maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, probably. What well, couldn't be made into a drink? Yeah, game. good point. Maybe our next game. Uh, this one we uh, played together, Mystic Veil. And I mean, we've talked about Mystic Veil on the show before. Yeah, we also played nice. a couple other games, but this is the one in particular we want to talk a little bit about. Because as you said earlier, it reminded you of something. Because uh, myself and my friend, and our friend Garrett, he went totally, was playing, he got to play his entire deck pretty much every turn. I didn't do too bad. John, on the other hand, it was terrible. <laughs> Both of us made your, your final score in our last turn. Our final scores, uh, I believe he had like, I want to say 62 or something like that. And mm -hmm. my score was 15. <laughs> uh, and yours was like around 40 or something like that. Yeah. And I know, because you know, ours didn't beat him to combine. Right. <laughs> so, and he, I mean, he really, it, by, by round four, Four or five, it seemed like he had just the perfect engine. No, it, that's ready. yeah. And it was really the first time playing Mystic Veil, which I've enjoyed. We've talked about it before, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I like it. It's not. I. I didn't never blew me away, but it was fine. Uh, this was the first time I played it, and I was really felt like I maybe never want to play this again. No, <laughs> I mean, was, oh, wait, wait, first of all, let's mention we're not using any of the promos or expansions. Just the base. Just the base. Um, and maybe that sounds petty just because I lost, but it really wasn't well, no, because about we, losing. Yeah. It was like, I felt like I never even had a chance. Right, and that's where I think, because we called it, in essence, this is almost like a deck building game. Oh, it's 100% a deck building game. I don't right. even think that's a... But to me, the problem is because you're upgrading cards and not adding to them, a lot of times in the deck, if someone starts running wild, usually it's their deck starts getting big and it's harder for them to pull off those turns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's not the case here. So if someone gets all those good cards to play their entire deck, right. you just sort of be like, well, I made three crystals. Yeah, because basically what ended up happening is whenever it was my turn, I just didn't have enough money. And then other people bought the good stuff. So like that was it. Uh, and so uh, most of my turns were like, I'd flipped two cards and done. And then Garrett would go and like 20 minutes of decision making and counting and flipping everything over. And which two cards should I buy from this side? And I'm just like, why am I even here? <laughs> I'm just going to leave because no, I'm not doing anything. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, yes, I'm sure people are going to say uh, RNG plays a role. And, and, and the deck, most deck building games, I should say. Uh, that plays a role, what comes out you can buy. 
But it just feels because there's that 20 card limit or the 20 card deck limit. Or is it 20? Uh, I, something in that area, yeah. You, it's easy, much easier to abuse. Yeah, it, it really, it, it's definitely a problem with uh, s the snowball thing. It's happened to us in like DC before right. as well, but. Not, I don't think it's as often as bad. Not like, not like this quite, quite this way. It is definitely something that a lot of deck building games have the potential for that is a danger right. though. But I just feel um, like it's much easier in this one. Yeah. That's why like, we, I bought this, we haven't used it. Uh, a promo card, Shard Eater. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the green card that gives you green trees, but it's a growth symbol. Growth symbol, but it hurts more. And I'm almost we're almost like maybe that should be replacing, not adding. Because that might it, you can buy less if you have that growth symbol. Right. It's, it's it's less strong than what's in the game, which allows you to really go out of control. But I mean, uh you let us know if you've done that. Also the expan like, that's why we mentioned expansions. They could easily fix a lot of those issues. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully they do. I, I know they finally uh Geeves put some details up. Uh, I don't have them <laughs> about that edge of uh, darkness. darkness game. No, I'm still excited, but that's my problem. In the end, I feel Mystic Veil vale is a tutorial. Yeah, not no, a I, I feel the same way. It's it's I feel like it's a it's a quarter of a game. <laughs> uh, and but you know, I mean, hey, they made a ton of money off it. No, so and that's they made the fine. right choice. And I think that's not maybe not a bad thing, depending on how big Edge of Darkness supposedly is. But like, I would love that mechanic in something like I'm thinking Mage Knight, which also has a deck building component. But that's not, it's not just a deck building game. Right. Exactly. Um, and so that's anyways, where I think I think it would shine. That's Mystic Veil. Vale. So soured on it uh, a little bit, but I mean. It's, all right. it's still all right. It's still mm -hmm. an all right game to, to check out if you like deck building games. Uh, let's close up with some comments from our friends and followers of the Meeple Gallery. Oh, those Meeple Gallery. There are, there are good friends. Uh, so a couple weeks ago we talked about this new Whitechapel game, White, Whitehall Mystery, mm -hmm. uh, which we remarked is, seems almost exactly like Letters from Whitechapel. They're, it's from the same company, of course. Uh, Dale McClung says this game is based on a different murderer than Jack the Ripper. Ah. So to me, it's like a completely different game non-related to the first. Well, I take a little bit of issue with this comment. <laughs> because uh, actually, that murder, this murder was never solved. So theoretically, no one actually knows who Jack the Ripper was. So <laughs> we really don't know who is who. And in the game, specifically, the Fantasy Flight game, mm -hmm. they do say it's Jack the Ripper. Oh, they so do. So they're, they're connecting them in their universe, at least. So I don't know, that's something. But if that's the, good for you, then good for you. Uh, but Jack Cimino, uh, who says he's a big fan of Whitechapel, says he's excited to play Whitehall. He feels it's kind of like how they brought out new maps for Ticket to Ride. Uh, there'll be uh, new routes to learn. So that's, that is another way of thinking of it, less of like, oh, disappointed, it's the same. It's more like a Ticket to Ride thing where it's just like a, people just have right. a different kind of spin Now, on do it. you think, because if this is based off a different murderer, Mm -hmm. That we're just gonna get a whole different series of murder games from Fancy Flight, <laughs> but still replacing Jack the Ripper with all of them. Like, one of them will be like the uh, Bundy murder, <laughs> but still Jack the Ripper. Right, right. Hannibal will get his own. Even, uh, Wayne Gacy or whoever. Yeah, I think that they will, and I think that they should. Um, so that's nice. Uh, we <laughs> <laughs> I like how that's how you end the murder story. Nice. That's nice. Uh, Tick is Great pointed us towards something really cool. Uh, we had talked about Avatar The Last Airbender, how they're doing this new pro bending game, mm -hmm. and how we thought an RPG would be a good way to go. Uh, there, he's put us a, a link to a fan made uh, RPG rules for D&D 3.5 that you can use if you want to actually play as Avatar Last Airbender races or classes or what have you in that world. So that's neat. Because we'll, we'll put the link in the description so yeah, you guys can check it so out. So you can check, check that out. Uh, and then last week we also talked about Gen Con 50 uh, and got a couple interesting comments. Shane's World said he had two badges secured and then when he priced flights, hotels, food, and games, it was just too much for him and he's not going anymore. I oh. guess he's going to sell his, his badges. So that is a, that is a thing that you can... Uh, it can be pricey. No, I mean, the, when there. I try to get uh, hotels mm -hmm. for us, they have a hotel thing, and, you know, once again, they give you a certain time window, which is obvious if you're not in the first few hours, you're screwed. <laughs> right. And, of course, same thing this year as last year, we were screwed. Um, so I actually bought, like, went through Expedia and stuff and got tickets that way. 
And then for this small hotel, still not far away, and it was relatively cheap, you know, it's, it's driving distance, but we drive there anyway, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when I looked, when our time was up, what would be away, I think the nearest hotel was twice the price and twice the distance away than what I bought. Yeah, so it, it can be tough. So, I, I, you know, don't blame anybody for, right. for not going for that reason, especially if, it, if unless you live close, it's, it's, it's uh, not a... Yeah, thank God for a... Uh, Pax uh, unplugged. That's right. That's our that's our <laughs> special benefit. Uh, yeah. And then uh, M Liddell, followed by four numbers. I don't feel like reading. Uh, said he's ready for Gen Con 50. This will be my 24th Gen Con overall. <laughs> so congratulations, dude. You've gone to almost half of them. <laughs> I'm almost a little sad. I wish we could get them back in time to, so you can get that 25. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Well, maybe if they open up another location or something like that, he can work, work some magic that way. So. There's a little <laughs> asterisk now, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, and then finally, the, I wanted to reach out to over on Board Game Geek. Uh, someone had some interesting things to say about this war of mine. Uh, the board game that we mm -hmm. gave our impressions of last week. Uh, says he thinks the experience does play well with four. Uh, but, Excellent. But the experience changes. Uh, in addition to the dread of the game, uh, the individual dynamic and reactions of individual players becomes a part of the experience. Uh, you get to observe each other as well as the game, and it can give yet more insights into the human condition. Uh, which is pretty cool, and more of a hot seat thing when you make that person have to make the decision for that round, kind no, of. No, I definitely think I can see that how that works out. I mean, I, I mean, playing the first of all, playing the zombie RPG in Last of Us made me realize how certain people would be very aggressive, or I actually should not trust that there's an actual zombie invasion. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. And also, I mean, this is a small one, and I will still contest to it. Is just, and but it's an, a fantastically interesting one is our debate on in the um, last night on earth on what does it mean to win you mean dead of winter dead of winter wow i'm mixing it up <laughs> uh, but like so i could totally mm. see this game bringing that that's a kind of deal with some of these things like uh, i mean it was just the two of us and usually we're pretty we were pretty in agreement when we didn't make a mistake or didn't like it wasn't but i could see especially it make more sense cuz some of those cards say don't show this to anyone when those could really shine and be like what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> right, yeah. No, that would be cool. I wonder if there's even maybe a way you could modify it so that you do control a specific character. Do you think that would work? Maybe, the only problem is people can die or leave. <laughs> uh, right. So in that regard, you'd have to do some tweaking, but, but that might no, be interesting, Well, that too. would be interesting, too, because it would be, what if it'd be, all right, you have to go around the table, you have to see what you're doing. What are you doing? I'm going out gathering because you're thinking I'm going to join you. I'm like, I'm sleeping. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, or like, hey, we really need you to build this tool bench. Like, uh, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm getting food. I'm hungry. <laughs> Something like that. So, I don't know. But good to hear that from other people. I know there's a lot of backers who still haven't gotten the game. People who got add-ons and things. I think there were delays. Uh, to be fair, with how well they packed it, it's probably just because <laughs> it takes a little bit longer. So be, be patient because it's worth the wait, I think. So check that out. Um, those are all our comments from the Meeple Gallery. Mm -hmm. That's it for our show, but uh, if you have comments like that, please leave them for us about this war of mine or any of the games that you talked about, Dyson Stein, mm -hmm. or if you're looking forward to any of the Planet of the Apes games <laughs> coming at us in the next four years probably, uh, leave a comment here on YouTube, or you could email us, rollforcrit at gmail.com. And of course, we're in other places, Twitter, Instagram, both at rollforcrit, mm -hmm. and many more, Facebook. Yeah. And, of course, we're hiding in your deepest, darkest closets. <laughs> Don't look. <laughs> uh, you can also like this video and subscribe. Tell your friends. We, we would, greatly appreciate we it. We would really love that a lot. We, we, we work hard for you. Mm -hmm. No not no pressure. But, of course, in the end, you could always get some board games. And where could they do that? They can do it at our website, rollforcrit.com, where we have board games for sale, plus all our links to videos just like this one, reviews, and more. More things coming your way. If you have any suggestions, ideas, comments, let us know. Concerns. We appreciate your fandom and your support. Until next time, I'm Jonathan Estes. And I'm Will Keeler. And this has been Roll for Crit. The movie. The ride. The show.